Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In all of my videos, I include links down in the video description that allow you to jump from one section of the video to another. So if you'd like to revisit one section or jump ahead to the next, you can do that. But I also include links to all of the things that I discuss in this podcast, including links to websites or patterns or techniques or other information that I talk about will be included down in the description. This week, I have a couple of tidbits to share with you. I want to tell you about something I learned from the comments on one of my videos this week that has to do with this sweater um, that I'm wearing right now. I have a finished project to share with you. I want to talk about what my next sweater project is going to be or could be and see what suggestions you might have in that regard. And then I will update you on my Roaring Twenties vintage sweater project. So let's get started. Tuesday was my birthday and it actually turned out to be a much better birthday than I anticipated considering the state of things in the world right now. Um, but I was really busy because I was working on a Technique Tuesday video. I don't do them every week. I was doing them every single Tuesday for three years. And then this year I decided to do them less often so that uh, I didn't get burned out on doing them. So this week I was really busy on Tuesday on my birthday uh, working on a video. I kept getting interrupted with uh, phone calls from my family and some friends uh, wishing me happy birthday, which was a little annoying while I was editing. So it sort of felt like very normal to me. And it turned out to be a really great way to celebrate my birthday. We couldn't go to the restaurant I norm we normally go to on my birthday. And in fact, they stopped doing pickup deliveries. They had been doing that for a while. So we got takeout from a Thai restaurant near us that we really like. And we decided to open up one of our good bottles of wine as well. So all in all, it was a really good birthday. And I was really happy about that. One of the things that I got for my birthday was a little uh, video clip from a little video from my sister-in-law she sent uh, to me. And I thought I would share this with you. Um, some of you may have seen this already. It's a, a dog, a miniature schnauzer named Pluto. And um, her owner is a wildlife photographer. She normally takes pictures of wildlife in Africa. She's Canadian. And so she took a picture of Pluto and then animated the mouth and then did a funny voice um, to uh, kind of lighten the mood in these times, but also give good advice about how to handle the stress of these times. And I really enjoy it. And it turns out that this woman, this wildlife photographer used to be a stand-up comic. So that's why, that's why some of the things that she says, she's just really good at, um, at communicating um, humor in these times. So I'm gonna share that with you uh, down in the description. I've been following a woman who's a sheep farmer in Ireland on Twitter for a couple of years. And so when I get up in the morning, she's been up for four, five, six hours already tending to her sheep farm and all of the animals that she has on the farm. And so it's the first thing I get to see every day is what's happening on her farm. I shared information about her a couple of years ago because on my birthday two years ago, I bought myself um, yarn from her sheep. Her sheep are Zartbless sheep. Um, they're originally from, the, uh, from Holland and Zwart meaning black and Bless meaning um, blaze. So they're black sheep and they have a white blaze on their nose. They have a white tail and two three or four of their legs will have little white socks on them. So it's a lambing season. So there's new lambs. She got, uh, her dog had puppies in January. And so the puppies are about nine weeks old now and are just adorable to watch romping around. So I'm going to share her information down. She's on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So she's got a website, um, but, and she sells yarn and she sells, she has blankets made from her yarn as well that she sells 
Um, but I just, I really, it, that's such a great way for me to start my day. The other thing that happened on my birthday is I, um, I do videos on Tuesdays and Fridays and one of the YouTube channels that I watch is called Vlog Brothers. It's two brothers, John Green and Hank Green. They've been doing videos since 2007 maybe 2007 or 8 something like that and I've been watching them since that first year and they both of them are authors and Hank uh, runs a company called Complexly that does the crash course videos so those are on YouTube and they're free and they follow the AP uh, high school AP uh, format for information and it's just a great way to learn um, but John did his video on Tuesday Hank does his on Fridays and his Tuesday video was 10 tips uh, for mental health um, care in in these times partners in health has doctors in areas where there are epidemics um, like Ebola and things like that and so they they are accustomed to this idea of social distancing and how to handle living in that way and so there's 10 tips so I'll share a link to that down down um, below as well because I think I'm doing pretty well on eight like about eight of them <laughs> but there's one I'm not doing Doing, um, that I really need to do and that is just get outside and walk or do some kind of exercise every day I know that when I do actually do that I feel much better but it's getting yourself to get out um, outside and do that um, that can be can be hard to do on March 13th which is a Thursday I mailed out two packages one to each of my daughters and they've been sitting on my kitchen table for a couple of months um, for my daughter in the Netherlands, I was sending her a, a socks that I'd knit for her and for her boyfriend, as well as uh, a little birthday present I'd bought for her and a little um, hat that we had bought um, for Sam. And we just had them sitting there on the table. And so finally, I mailed those out to her. And then my daughter in Chicago, I mailed the the pillow that I'd finished that was my Finish It February project, as well as the half-finished sweater that I'd been knitting. It's a top-down cream colored sweater with cables that I was unsure about the actual length and a couple of people had said why don't you just mail it to her I'm like oh that's a good idea so that too had been sitting and sitting and sitting so th Thursday March 13th I finally mailed them out and that Monday both of the packages got there the, the package that got to Chicago I had sent it to my daughter's work workplace um, but they had instituted this order that Friday, the day after I'd sent the package saying, you need to work from home from now on. So the package is sitting at her workplace. So she hasn't actually received it yet. The same day, that Monday after I had shipped it out, my daughter in the Netherlands received her package. I couldn't believe it got there so fast. They told me it was going to take two or three weeks. So she watched my uh, Casual Friday this past week and, and she and her boyfriend watched it and they're like, why didn't you show our socks that you sent to us? So, um, so I'm going to show you now the socks that I uh, made for my daughter and her boyfriend. And what was really nice was that he apparently was wearing them later that day when he went down to get some groceries and he texted her while he was out saying, these socks are amazing. So... Yay, that always makes me happy to hear. So I have mentioned many times that I am an information seeker. And so when I get interested in something and I have enough foundation, sort of basic foundation to build other information on, all the new pieces of information get taken in within the context of what I already know. And then if something seems to conflict with something that I think I know, then I try to figure out, do these things really conflict or is it just that this one is true in some cases and this is true in other cases? So with knitting, one of the things I love about knitting is that there's an endless amount of things that I can learn about it. And so one of the reasons that I am knitting my way through the 20th century in the form of vintage sweaters is because there's so much to learn. And so I pick a sweater pattern based on something that I know I can learn from it. Like the sweater that I'm wearing is my 1930s vintage sweater that I knit the end of last summer and, and then into the early fall. And I chose it because this yoke has a really unusual construction. It was one I'd never seen before and I really uh, wanted uh, to try it out and see how it worked. And 
and it's a yoke it's a yoke sweater that has set in sleeves and normally when you see a yoke sweater it's coming down to the underarms and I just I don't like um, that feeling so I so I really like set in sleeves so that was something that was really interesting to me well the other thing that I have discovered about vintage patterns is that whatever it is that I think I'm going to learn there's going to be at least one thing I did not expect to learn and that surprises me so this sweater, was, the construction of this sweater begins at the back. And this is true for every sweater I have ever knit. Whether it's knit in the round, uh, well, in the round, you're beginning the whole thing at one time. But if it's knit flat, you always begin at the back. And this sweater was like that. It told me to cast on a certain number of stitches. And then it told me to work in Knit One Pro One ribbing for 20 rows. No problem. And then I moved on to the back and, and all of that. Well then, for the fronts, the instructions were to cast on whatever number of stitches. And row one said to knit through the back loop for all of the stitches. And then it had instructions for how to uh, work the ribbing plus also work this garter stitch border. So there's a button band or buttonhole band depending on whether which, which side of the cardigan you're working on. But ultimately, you were only working 18 rows of the ribbing. So you're working one row through the back loops and then 18 rows of ribbing. So that's 19 rows altogether where the back was 20 rows of ribbing. I was very confused about that and I spent a long time trying to figure it out. And ultimately, I decided not to do mine that way, but instead uh, to do it so that I had equal numbers of ribbing and that I had the cast on method that I used. I had the public side um, is the smooth side of the long tail cast on. That's what I like. And so I, I worked I worked it out that way. But I, and I never figured out why they were saying to work through the back loop. I, I did swatching. So with the vintage patterns, I try to follow the instructions as written unless I absolutely know that a different technique is going to work better for me. Um, I, like I don't slip the first stitch of a row if it's going to be if that stitch is going to be seamed because I'll get a better result with mattress stitch if I work that edge in stockinette. Um, but I did work, you know, I did slip the selvages here at the button bands. So, um, so if there's a, a question that I have about a particular instruction, I will try it or I will at least swatch it and see, well, maybe, maybe they know something I don't know about. Like maybe there's a reason why they're specifying to do this. And so I'll try it on a swatch and then I'm like, mm, um, don't like that. Or, oh, wow, I didn't ever expect that. And so this is part of the process is what, am I, what can I learn from these patterns? So yesterday I got a comment on the video from last fall where I was talking about the modifications that I was making for this sweater and because I had to make some modifications for sizing as well. She saw that video and she commented and she said, well, that's a UK pattern, which is true. So it was a pattern that was published in the UK. And she said, I was taught to knit in the 50s. I was taught to cast on by the newfangled cable cast on, which obviated the need to knit into the back of the stitches on the first row. The difference between the new cable cast on and the original was that in the cable method, the new stitch is slightly twisted before it goes on the left-hand needle. The original method required the stitches to be knitted into the back in the second row because if you don't do that little twist that we all do automatically now, the edge would be very loopy and loose. It was a method of tightening the cast on and making it look neater. This was something that all knitters knew at this time, and the pattern didn't need to remind you for the back, two fronts, and the sleeves. Once would be sufficient. This pattern obviously predates the newfangled cable cast on. So it took me a little while to sort out what she meant by newfangled cable cast on versus the old cast on. At first, I thought she was talking about the old method of working the cable cast on rather than a new method, because there are two ways of working the cable cast on, you could, of, of putting the stitches on the needle. There are two different ways. And I've done a video where I've talked about that before and why I do it the way I do it and the research into, am I doing it wrong? Because I'm just doing what I learned like 30 years ago and I never checked again you know so I went through a whole process where I was investigating that so at first I thought she was talking about the new ca cable cast on versus the old cable cast on but it, but what she meant I've realized was she was talking about 
knitting on, the knitted on cast on versus the cable cast on. So she said she learned to knit in the 50s and this sweater was designed in the 30s. So I decided to go look in my source of UK knitting books, which is all of these 1940s books, because I knew that these books that were written by Jane Coster and Margaret Murray, I knew that they had multiple methods of casting on, but I hadn't really paid attention. Uh, you know, I couldn't remember which ones uh, they had in there. And I, and I was curious also about whether the sweater patterns in here mentioned starting the first row by knitting through the back loop. I hadn't noticed it, but I wasn't looking for it. So I went in and it turns out they have three different methods that they explain for casting on in the 1940s. I don't have a, a, a similar knitting book like this from the 1930s that's from the UK. But in the 1940s, um, the first method they had in here, they called the thumb method, uh, which is actually the long tail cast on method where you have the, the creating the, the twisted loop in your left hand like you would for any long tail cast on, but you're holding the working yarn end in your right hand so that you're knitting the English style. So they call that the thumb method. And what they said was this is the preferred method for general knitting because it you know produces a nice, a nice stable stretchy edge. Um, then the second method they explain is knitting on, which they call two needle method. This results in an untidy loopy edge, which can be avoided only if the first row is knitted into the back of the cast on stitches, a slow laborious process, which produces an inelastic edge. It is not advisable, for instance, to use it for children's garments, which have to be pulled on over the head. So the third method that they describe is corded method, and this is the cable cast on, and they describe it as a suitably strong edge for garments subjected to hard wear. So that was really interesting. So that was the 1940s. So I looked through the knitting manuals that I have that are published in the US, but I have more over a wider range. And the ones from the 1940s show the long tail cast on and knitting on. The books that I have from the 1930s, this one has knitting on. Another book I have, I don't think even, maybe only has knitting on. The earlier ones I'll have knitting on. But I knew that I had read in some of the UK manuals from the 19th century that they would describe methods of casting on that I couldn't understand from the written instructions. And it was like they would use the same, it was like they copied it from one book to another. So trying to find those, I couldn't find those, but I do have a copy of a UK book from the, from 1858. It's This is a reproduction copy, so they've scanned it and they've basically taken you know, images of this book and then reprinted them. It's called Plain Needlework and All Its Branches, The Finchley Manuals of Industry. This is where I found that method of grafting that I called the Finchley uh, method, uh, which allows you to do it from the pearl side. It's very simple. But I wanted to see what they said in here for casting on, because I remember reading it before and not quite understanding what they were getting at. And I've had several months, almost a year <laughs> of um, break from it. And I've come back to it. And now I understand uh, what those instructions were. I was able to do it. And I'll, I'll show you an overhead of that. Um, but, the, but the method that they're describing in here is the long tail cast on. As the first thing is to be learned in knitting is to cast on the stitches. What is your method of doing this? Being provided with a ball of worsted or cotton and needles, I take a length of the worsted in my right hand, putting it once round the little finger, passing it under the two next fingers, and bringing it over the forefinger. And then I take one of the knitting needles between the finger and thumb. What next? Then I take the end of the length of worsted in my left hand and twist it round the little finger bringing it over the thumb and round the two forefingers so as to form a loop. Then I put the needle under the lower worsted of the loop and bring it above that which goes over the first finger. Well, next I pass the worsted which is over the forefinger of the right hand under the needle, bring the needle down through the loop, 
draw the worsted tight in the left hand and thus the stitch is completed. So, but it's really interesting to know that, that many of the UK patterns would have assumed that you were doing knitting on as a cast on at some point in time. I still haven't solved the question about why this pattern wanted 20 rows of ribbing on the back and a row of twisted stitches and, and 18 rows of ribbing on the front. I still think it might have something to do with the garter stitch edge and what they wanted that edge to look like and but it's it's still kind of unclear but it was a really interesting insight that this assumption of a knitted on cast on and then having to work through the back on the first row that was something that helped me take these little pieces of information that I didn't understand and then they kind of clicked into place I still have some unanswered questions but I understand more now than I did before I mentioned last week that there was a period of time I had a couple of days when I was kind of stuck on my vintage sweater project and my head was swirling with what was going on in the world I couldn't calm down enough to knit and I was looking for, I didn't have any other knitting projects. <laughs> like it, it, it was a surprise to me that it was a problem not to have a, another work in progress around. So you know, a lot of times I would just start a sock or do whatever. Um, so I had ordered a kit from Jameson and Smith for this uh, beanie called the Roadside Beanie. And I started that last week and I finished it. I, I still have a lot of ends that <laughs> haven't been woven in. One of the things that I did, because I'd heard about a Shetland wool, that it's a woolen spun yarn and that when you block it, it kind of blooms and kind of fills in spaces and the fuzziness kind of causes the color work um, to kind of blend together in a different way that you don't have these sharply defined uh, lines of the stitches in this color and the stitches in that color. Uh, which is what I've got right now with my uh, vintage sweater project because that yarn is extremely smooth. And then I was looking for information on how to block this because one of the things I've read about Shetland wool in the past is that they, uh, in Shetland, they have um, woolly, what they call them, woolly blockers, I think. They're sweater blockers and it's kind of a frame that you put the Shetland sweater on for, for drying. And it's because there's something about uh, the structure of Shetland um, fibers that they want to contract. Like most knitting doesn't do that. Like it wants to stretch out. You, you can easily stretch it when, when it's wet and it will stay in that shape. But there's something about Shetland wool that will want to contract um, as it's drying. And so you have to um, put it over some kind of a form while it's driving. Otherwise it will uh, shrink. So. We have this business in town called Axeman, and it's where all of these like bits and pieces get sent. Like they just buy, it's not like it's junk, it's like overstock of thing. Like if you've ever seen like an old army surplus story, like the stuff that would get like sent there that they would accumulate. So if you want to, you know, if you're an artist who likes to build things from like weird stuff, you could go there. So we, we were at a restaurant one time in the shopping center where Axeman is and we were walking by and I saw like a whole bunch of these mannequin heads in the window and I went, oh, I want one of those because, um, you know, like just to take photographs of hats or whatever to have it on there. And so they had, um, they had, this is a man's head, but they also had a woman's head and I wanted one that was bigger because I have a styrofoam head that's really a wig. It's for wigs, so it's smaller than my actual head. And so it's always kind of sloppy. So this is a little bigger. And so this actually measures the same size as my head. So when I, when this was wet, uh, first I tried it on the styrofoam head and it was just too sloppy. And so I put it on this head and also I was a little worried that this was a little pointy on top. So I was able to kind of smash it down and in, in, into place. And so I dried it on this head overnight and it, um, it fits, fits me just fine. Uh, it's not too loose uh, that way. And, um, it worked out pretty well. I, 
I've been trying to, I've been trying to decide what I want to do with the ends. Another thing that I had heard about Shetland wool is because it's so sticky that some Shetlanders don't even bother to, don't bother to weave in the ends on their sweaters. They just, you know, apparently they will tie a knot close to the surface to prevent it working itself back into the fabric. And then they'll just trim these down like an inch or so, and then that all felts into place. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is get a sharp tapestry needle and just skim into the backs of some of the stitches. That's often what I do with stranded color work. You can't really do the reverse duplicate stitch that you can do in other uh, types of knitting, at least not very well. I was really interested in seeing, you know, what the stickiness actually was with this uh, yarn and how that behaved. And I can see now why people who do things that need to be steaked, a lot of times with this type of yarn, they don't even bother to anchor the stitches. They don't worry about them uh, fraying because it's such sticky wool, it's just not going to come undone. I don't, I'm not crazy about my stranded color work skills. Uh, this hat is a little different from what you'd see in like traditional fair owl knitting for a couple of reasons. One is that the sheep that are on here are pretty wide. So you have a really long span of white stitches where you're, you'd be carrying the other yarn behind. And in fair owl knitting, like true fair owl knitting, which is a subset of stranded color work, you would change yarns no more. You would have no more than like five or six stitches in a row uh, before you'd have to switch colors. And so you'd never need to trap the floats. So I did use the weaving method of trapping floats and because the sheep are white and the, it's dark green in the back, you can see the little greens and I don't mind it too much, but I could have used one of those methods like, like a jacquard method, a ladder back, or they have a bunch of different ones. Like Susan Rainey has a method, Sockmetician has a method, I think Tech Knitter has a method for um, preventing having to uh, trap floats so that they and so that you don't get those colors showing. I was more interested in just knitting and experiencing the wool and what this how this wool behaves. That was really interesting to me. So the other thing that's unusual in this particular hat pattern was that you can see where there's like a little uh, kind of white line here. What what this is this hat represents is what you would see called the roadside beanie, what, what you would see on the roadside in Shetland. And what you see are sheep and boats. And so what this is representing is you're, you're on land and then you're, you're, it transitions into the sea. And so the, the white is like little white caps, little waves on the water. And there was this section right below that that used two colors that had the same color value, which means if you look at them in black and white, they look essentially the same. And one of the two colors was this blue color that you see here on the bottom. And the other color was this green one that you see up here by the boats. And what this pattern is having you do is work the two of them together underneath this part where the white is. And I was really struggling, partly because I'm partially colorblind, and, uh, but it, the color values were so, the, were so close to the same, it was really hard to, to tell them apart. And I thought, why would they do that? That like violates the rules where you're supposed to have more contrast. They actually have different color values. And then I realized, oh, it's water and it's sort of that sea green color. It was meant to blend together. It wasn't meant to create a geometric, um, traditional Shetland pattern um, that you would see in, um, in typical Fair Isle um, sweaters or hats or things like that. So that was really interesting. So that was a, a something I learned about, oh, they were doing that as a deliberate technique for blending color which I thought was really interesting, but it, it did make it hard for me <laughs> um, to differentiate the colors. So that was a, a really fun project. And uh, I guess I'm really only 99% of the way done because of these ends, but I'll take care of those tomorrow afternoon. So I want to talk about what my next sweater project is going to be. I can see right now that I'm going to need to start a pair of socks for somebody in my family pretty soon, just so that I always have um, something on the needles um, that I can turn to if I get stuck 
I, like I did a couple of weeks ago um, when I was trying to, to figure out what um, what to do and my mind was spinning. I just need to always have something on the needles. So I, I do want to think about my next sweater project because this my Roaring Twenties sweater project will be done soon. <laughs> Uh, and I want to figure out what to start next. And so I want to get you your input into what you think might be interesting um, to, to do next. I'm going to tell you my ideas. These are all things that I'm going to do at some point. It's just which one am I going to do next? So I was talking in the tidbit section about Zwart Bless Ireland, the woman who's a sheep farmer. I bought yarn from her for my birthday as a birthday present to me two years ago and I did uh, design an Aran sweater and I started knitting it and realized that I picked up the wrong needles off of my um, uh, desk and I was knitting it at a looser gauge than I had intended to. It was going to fit me but I was not knitting at the gauge I wanted. I wanted to knit at a really firm gauge so that the sweater won't pill and it will be really hard wearing and it will last for a long time. So the sweater is designed but it has to be re-knit. So this is the point where I got to um, before with it. So this is the design but this is not how far I am. This is uh, me not wanting to rip out something until the new thing is farther past this so that I don't just feel terrible about losing everything. So, so this is uh, one thing I could do is my Erin sweater that I designed. The next thing I could do is uh, I want to do a Danish traditional sweater. So I, I bought this book last fall, Traditional Danish Sweaters, and this is fascinating to me. And I, I, I talked about that Charles the First uh, silk shirt that he was executed in. I was talking about that earlier this year, and uh, that was a, a, a knit pearl pattern. It was a brocade type of pattern or damask pattern, I guess, that really wealthy people were wearing back in like the 16th century. And that particular style of stitch patterns then was adopted by the lower classes in a couple of different ways. One of them, like you'll notice, like the, the fisherman Gansies, those blue um, sweaters that fishermen in the UK wore for centuries, have these sort of knit pearl patterns. I have a couple of cables maybe, but a lot of the knit pearl patterns. So that those were influenced by these uh, silk shirts of the, of the wealthy. And then in Denmark, those kinds of silk uh, shirts were also imported either from like Spain or maybe France and uh, to Denmark, the wealthy people would have silk versions. And she talks about that in here. And then so regular people, women wore wool versions. They would, they would knit them from a cream colored, just a natural colored wool. And then they would take them to somebody who would do the dyeing and they would either be dyed, they would be dyed in one of several colors. Red was typically for the good one that they would wear. But these sweaters were worn basically 24 seven as part of their complete outfit. Uh, it was a, a layer of it. So they wore them at night, they wore them during the day. Um, and they had, but one of the things that they had in here were these stars. And it's the same sort of eight pointed star that you see in Norwegian color work, but this is texture. And so this book, she's got a few patterns in there, but she's also has a section on designing your own. She's got an extensive sti stitch dictionary. She went to all of these museums and, and looked at all the different star patterns. And there's a particular star pattern in here that I love that I want to use. So my, and these are not like complicated shapings. They have certain elements that are really interesting, like a split hem, uh, which I think would be interesting and look at the techniques that she's using to do that. And then, you know, there's sort of a basic structure for these kinds of things. And then of course you can use your own creativity to do whatever you want. So I knew that at some point I wanted to knit a sweater from here or design something from here. And when I was down in Santa Fe over the holidays, I went to a shop and I bought some yarn that I knew I could make into a sweater at some point, but it was a yarn that I had never knit with before. And it's this uh, Mirasol Huni uh, yarn from Peru, uh, from Peru. And I bought enough to make a sweater. And I bought enough to make like a vintage sweater. I, I was just wasn't sure what I was going to uh, make with it. And when I was checking out, 
she offered me a Danish Christmas cookie and I said, oh, because I could she hear she had an accent. I said, oh, are you from Denmark? And she said, uh, yes. And I said, oh, I just bought the, this book. And so I decided right then that the yarn I bought from her would be used to make a sweater from this book. So it's a kind of a heathery navy blue um, yarn. And so I will, I will make something from that with this, but that's, that's a choice. So I don't, I, I quickly look through here. I don't think that there's a pattern in here that I already like, like a completed sweater pattern. So it would have to be something that I would either modify or I would design myself. And she has a section in here about how to design your own. So that's my second choice. Uh, the third choice would use a skein of yarn that I dyed at our fall, our guild's fall retreat. I went with a, a new knitting group I uh, was invited into. They went on a field trip down to Northfield, which is about an hour north of the Twin Cities. We went to a yarn shop there and then went to lunch. So I wanted to find a yarn to make a sweater that where I could use this. And my idea was to knit a sweater where I would use intarsia cables using this yarn and then the rest of the sweater would be you know, from some kind of solid color. So this is kind of a dark gray yarn. Um, it uses the fiber company's Cumbria Unto the Hills. It's a, a blend of masham wool, merino, and mohair. So that sounds like an interesting um, blend of yarn. So that's the third choice. And then the fourth choice would be to, to continue my march through the 20th century vintage sweaters and, and find something from the 1940s. Now, uh, so I could use one of my many books that are from the 40s. Some of the books I bought recently that, that are American books are these Minerva Complete Knitting Manuals from 1936 and 1941. And these have uh, 1940s um, sweater patterns or 30s and 40s sweater patterns in them, but they tell you how to measure yourself and how to uh, change um, how to modify it to fit you and they use this whole schematic system that I thought was really interesting So I do want to do that at some point So it could be something from here or it could be something uh, based on the information I learned from here That would be what I'll be doing for the 1940s So I don't know what yarn I would use though So I want to use the yarn that I already have I don't want to have to buy anything because uh, I have plenty of yarn to make sweaters in my office here I do have some natural colored Cascade 220. I have enough of it to make a sweater, I think. But I wouldn't want to do it in that color, so then I would have to dye it. And then I'd have to dye it in a way that, that was even through all of the skeins. So I'm curious about what you guys would be interested in seeing. Because like I said, I'll be doing all four of these at some point. It's just which one should I do next? The, the Aran sweater with the Zwartbliss yarn. The Danish night sweater, uh, used in then designing from that book by uh, Vivian Hooksbro. The sweater I would design completely for myself, which would take me a while because I haven't really thought about exactly how, what kind of cable patterns I would want to uh, use for that, but it would be using an interesting technique of intarsia cables. Um, or should I do a vintage 1940s sweater from one of the, the manuals that I have? So let me know down in the comments uh, what you think would be really interesting to see next. I was kind of stopped on my Roaring Twenties sweater last week because I had, I had created all the little colored squares that I needed for the collar and I chained them all together and I'd begun working the the black, you're supposed to outline each three sides, the three sides that weren't chained together, the three sides with black, keep going all the way around, and do a row of that and then do a row of beige. And the instructions weren't clear about whether this should all be done from the right side of the work or whether you do the black from the right side and then the beige from the wrong side. Or, you know, I was trying a couple things and I really didn't like the results because I felt like they were kind of zigzaggy and the photograph from the pattern showed these black lines were pretty, like pretty straight looking. But I didn't know if that was because it was a colorized photo and the artist had just <laughs> drawn them in black or if there was something, uh, a technique that they weren't mentioning or that I was, maybe my crochet technique was just wrong, like how I was doing it. I didn't know what I was going to do about it. 
And so I got a lot of really great suggestions about either alternatives I could do or um, for suggesting how I could approach it. The first clue I got that made a huge difference was to edge the squares with the color, what, whatever color the square was done in, work around that edge first and that would create um, a, a, a normal edge to, to do the single crochet with the black and with the beige. And I wouldn't have that kind of really weird sawtooth uh, look. So I thought, well, that's brilliant. And so, um, so I did a set of experiments. I did eight experiments, um, which I will show you. So the first thing that I did was to not border in yellow, but just to show if I did the squares as they were, and I went around with black first from the right side, uh, what does it look like if I then go around beige from the right side um, using the entire um, black stitch, the, the two, the V, the, the whole V of each black stitch, if I went under both of those legs and created the white, what does that look like? And then for the second half, I went around like one and a half sides and then I went through the only, through the back only of the black while I was working the beige to see what that looked like. I took the beige out and the second experiment was to do the beige from the wrong side of the work. And I did under both legs of the V for half and then I went only through the front of the black because I was on the wrong side of the work. Uh, so I did that. So those were the first four experiments. Then I took uh, the beige out and I took the black out and I went around the, uh, the square with the color that the square was made from originally. So I did uh, three sides. It was a yellow square. So I did three sides in yellow. And then I repeated that experiment where I did um, black all the way around. And then I tried with the beige again, regular um, through both legs of the black when I was using the beige and then just through the back to see what that looked like. And again, I repeated the, took the beige out and then tried it from the wrong side. So those were my eight experiments. And I had one that I liked the best, but what I had also decided was that I was going to need to redo these crochet squares to begin with because by doing, by, by outlining them with the same color, it was making it was making them wider and it was just going to add too much a width to these squares for for the collar so i'd already decided i was going to have to redo these these squares and then uh, before i outlined them all and which is okay because i didn't i you know I, i'm not a great crocheter and i'm getting better every time a number of people have said well you know go up a crochet hook because your your squares are curling and that will help with the curling so I, I had decided that what i liked was outlining in the in the yellow then working the black and then from the right side and then working the beige from the right side i knew that i wanted to do all of that from the right side but i couldn't really decide whether I liked working the back of the black through the uh, working the beige through the back of the black or working the beige under both uh, legs of the V of each black stitch. So, so a couple of people in in my Ravelry group, you know, kind of said, "Well, this is the one I like," and and so I decided because this is for my my Roaring Twenties sweater that I would go to the All Things Vintage uh, group on Ravelry. And specifically to the Roaring Twenties knit along um, that I'm participating in and get some feedback from those people. And so I said, well, you know, he, and I explained, you know, this is, this is the problem I'm having and, and here's what I'm thinking. Are, does anybody have any opinions? And, you know, a couple of people chimed in and then there was a crochet designer. She said, what, what I would recommend doing is to go through the back only of the yellow while you're doing the black and then go through the back only of the black while you're doing the beige. She also gave a really interesting tip for doing the corners because it had been suggested to me to work the corners, do three single crochets in the corner to help you turn. And she said, I'll do a single crochet and then chain two and then do another single crochet. She says you might be able to do a chain one. It's a small enough square. You might be able to get away with just a chain one in between. So I was like, oh, that's an interesting tip. But then 
she said, but to, as I'm doing the yellow all the way around, she said, go through the back of um, what you're doing that yellow as well. And I'm like, but how can I do that? There's no, there's no back to go through. These are like the edges and the bottom. And she said, well, no, you can go through the back. You know, when you're on that, on the, the starting chain, there should be like a little bump on the back that you could go through. And, and I was looking at my squares and I'm like, the, <laughs> I don't see how to do it on that, on the edges. Um, there was like every other row I could see like the two strands of the end stitch. And I'm like, okay, I could choose to go through, you know, one of those instead of both of those. But the alternate rows are kind of twisted with a knot, the same way that when you are knitting flat, you usually have one stitch that looks like a regular stitch and then the other one that's a knot. And I was like, I don't see what I would even go into. And then the stitches are so tiny in my crochet hook doesn't have like a little pointy hat at the top like a lot of them do it's completely round like there's no way I can get it through there and so I said you know what would be the advantage of doing that because it's the same color and she's like well it would just basically would look completely invisible like you didn't even have it she said it's really a nitpicky thing but but I was intrigued by it like I'm I'm not going to do that because I like literally physically can't do it um, but I am interested in the idea of that. I did crochet something with some really um, some burnett roving which is just like a, a single there's no plies to it on a huge crochet hook so I could see like where would I do this if I wanted to go through the back of an edge and I couldn't figure out where I would even do that or how I would do that and I looked for videos I looked you know I looked in my crocheting for dummies book that I have up here, this thing has been always answered every question I've had, does not address um, this at all. So I don't know if any of you have experience with that. If you have any idea of how to do it, like either a photograph or a video, all of the videos I've seen on crocheting through the back only have to do with just uh, across a regular uh, row which is to me pretty obvious what to do and how to do that I don't have any problem with that it's going through on an edge uh, how would you do something like that so if anybody has any clues please let me know well that's it for this week's casual friday if you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.